Again, be opening to Revelation 3, verse number 7. If you're not there already, Revelation 3, verse 7. As on Wednesday evenings, we are studying the book of Revelation. Very last of the 66 books of the Bible. Once we get through chapter 3, as we've been saying, we should cover about a chapter a week, so we'll pick up speed. But we're looking now at the seven letters to the seven churches of Asia. And thus far up to now, we've covered how many? One? Five. Five. We've covered five, okay? And that means we have two to go, and we should get one tonight, and then one for the winning next Wednesday evening. So again, by way of review, as we're looking at these congregations, we look at us. Which of the seven churches had left their first love? Starts with an E, Ephesus, Ephesus. Which of the seven churches had a woman named Jezebel causing problems? Thyatira. Which of the seven lived where Satan's seat was? Pergamos. Pergamos. Which of the seven was dead? Sardis. We hadn't got way out of sea the gun there. I know we're all ready for Laodicea, but we will cover that hopefully next week. Which of the seven Jesus had nothing bad to say about? And we'll add one more to that tonight, and that is the church at Philadelphia. So actually two congregations, Jesus really had nothing bad to say about them. So we're looking this evening at verses 7 through 13, the church at Philadelphia. Now, the name Philadelphia means what? Love. Brotherly love. And the city was named that by a king who loved his brother so much, I'm going to call the city Philadelphia because I love my brother so much. And so it just simply means brotherly, brotherly love. And whenever I think about Philadelphia, I think about what state? Most people think about Pennsylvania. Now, when I moved to Mississippi, I kept hearing people talk about going to Philadelphia and going to Houston. And I'm thinking, boy, you folks sure travel an awful long way. But of course, as we know, there's a Philadelphia, Mississippi and a Houston, Mississippi. That's what they were talking about. Coming from Kentucky, I was just absolutely dumbfounded to hear people talk about the city of Louisville. In Kentucky, they run you out of town if you say Louisville. How do they pronounce it? Louisville. The S is silent. But in Mississippi, it's Louisville. And you know, we wonder why people hate the English language. Those words or names are spelled exactly alike. L-O-U-I-S-V-I-L-L-E. Louisville or Louisville. And depending on where you are, depends on the pronunciation. And there are a lot of words in our English language that cause people problems. But anyway, this is uh, not Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, or Mississippi. This is Philadelphia in the country today of Turkey. There are 12 Philadelphias in this country. And those close by, including Mississippi, there's one in Tennessee, Alabama, and Arkansas. Now today, Philadelphia, they don't call it that today. They call it, let's see if I, I've got the pronunciation here, Alashahir. Alashahir is the, the Turkish name of that. Population today of about 50,000, so maybe a bit bigger than, than Tupelo. They grow tobacco, raisins, grapes, and fruits. Temperature there is about like it is here. The high Last week was 63 and the low about 55, so not a whole lot of difference between there and here. I did a little research, just what if you were to travel to this city today? And I started looking at some hotels and I was dumbfounded at how absolutely cheap. You were talking $32 a night. And these were nice, I mean, they had pictures on the web. These were nice looking motels and hotels. And I guess one reason they're so low is 
they want you to leave and go over there and visit them. <laughs> and they'll give you that perk. We'll let you stay at a nice motel for free. If you'll spend a lot of money just getting over here, we'll treat you fine. That's really not a huge tourist area though. And that might, might be another reason why the, the rates are so low because it's really not a high tourist area in, in that part of Turkey. This is an earthquake prone area. Earthquake prone area, uh, 1969, a major earthquake struck and killed upwards of 50 plus people. So that's pros and cons of living anywhere, I guess. A lot of folks like to live in California. That is an earthquake prone area. Now, close to us, we live close to what fault line? Madrid fault line, which is, I say close, a lot closer to mom and dad than to us. That is, uh, they say it's not a matter of if, but what? When. You know, Memphis is an earthquake prone area. If that hits, that's going to be a tough situation, but may never hit in our lifetime, may never hit again. We don't know. But this, this city, Philadelphia, was an earthquake prone area. If we look at our Bible maps, I know we've all been anxious look at our Bible maps and find Philadelphia on our Bible maps and I'm turning to mine in the back of my Bible. So I have found the city of Philadelphia. <clears throat> we studied Sardis last week, so looking at a Bible map, Philadelphia would be what direction from Sardis? North, south, east, west, or combination? Southeast. Southeast. More east than south, but in a southeast direction, not far, about 25, 30 miles south, southeast from Sardis. And this is where Jesus addressed the letter to. This city, as most of these other cities, they were, uh, it was located on a major trade route from east to west, so a very important trade center. And like these other cities, whenever you are located at the crossroads of trade routes, are you going to be rich or poor? Rich. You're going to be rich. I mean, you've got <laughs> goods coming through your town. You've got merchants coming through your town. You've got a lot of trade going on in this area. So again, a wealthy, a wealthy city and a wicked city, as were some of these others. It has so many temples and festivals dedicated to false gods that some nicknamed Philadelphia Little Athens. The Big Athens was Athens, Greece, and they had idols everywhere. Well, Philadelphia wasn't far behind. They had a lot of idols and festiv uh, festivities to these false gods. Now, the city sat on the edge of what they called the burned land, the burned land. This was a volcanic area, and this had a, an abundance of mineral waters. And the sick from all over the Roman Empire would come and bathe in these waters, thinking that and maybe there was some health benefits to bathing in that. What city in Arkansas do people like to go to for the water? Hot Springs, Hot Springs, Arkansas. And uh, a lot of people enjoy that. Philadelphia was destroyed by an earthquake in AD 17. Tiberius said, I'll help you rebuild the city. But he said, thanks. And he did that. But a lot of, uh, for a lot of years after that, the people just knew that the ground was shaking. And there were tremors. Instead of going, living in back, in, instead of going to live back in town, guess what they did? I'm gonna pitch my tent out in the countryside. That way, if there's an earthquake, how many buildings are going to fall on you if you're out in the countryside? Well, none. And it took a while for people to finally move back into the town because, again, of that fear, you know, of waking up or not waking up because of a massive earthquake hitting. So for a while, people lived in the countryside, and finally, they moved back into, into town. Now, again, this is a short letter, so we shouldn't have any problems if, if, we, if I'll get to going uh, covering this this evening. Adam, if you will, read for us verses 7 through 10. Revelation 3, 7 through 10, please. Uh, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. 
I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast, uh, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them in the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Okay, so let's back up now to verse 7, and just, we may not hit every aspect of these verses, but we'll hit some of the high points at least. Jesus is writing this letter. And he says, he gives a rather lengthy introduction of himself in verse 7. First of all, he says, uh, these things saith he that is holy. What's it mean to be holy? Set apart. Set apart, sanctified, distinctive. We read of, in the Bible, holy things and holy people and holy places. And so, of course, we're not surprised that Jesus himself is is holy. You may recall when Jesus was on earth, the Jews began to hate him, and they did their utmost to try to find something wrong in the life of Jesus that they could accuse him of something wrong, of wrongdoing. Were they successful? Not at all. Not at all. Now, they trumped up some things, obviously, and they lied about the Lord. And when Pilate, the Roman ruler, examined Jesus, at the end of the day, he said, I find no fault in this man. For good reason. There was no fault to be found. Jesus is holy, and 20 centuries this side of all that, he's still holy. So it's not just anybody writing this letter. Listen up. This is the one who is perfect. This is the one who is the Son of God speaking. A second attribute not only is Jesus holy, he is what? True. He that is true. You've heard people today say, well, truth really cannot be known. Truth is relative. Whatever truth means to you is fine. Whatever truth means to me is fine. We really can't know absolute truth, they say. Well, Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am, among other things, the truth. He said, you shall know the truth. I thought you couldn't know truth. Well, Jesus says you can. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So Jesus is the real thing. He's true, genuine, original. He's not a copy. Unlike those hundreds of thousands of gods in that day and in our day, their man-made Jesus is true. Now, we're going to get down to verse 9. The Jews who lived in Philadelphia were not true. In fact, Jesus will say of them, they do lie. They do lie. So he stands in opposition to those Jews in the city of Philadelphia. So true stands in opposition to that which is false or to lying. I didn't realize this. We were watching an episode of a show on TV the other night. I think it was Dateline, actually. And I didn't realize that in our country, the police are allowed in interrogation, they're allowed to lie to a suspected criminal. Now, in Britain, they're not. But police, and this, this fellow was being interviewed, and they said, we've got witnesses, we've got evidence that you were in that house. They didn't have a shred of evidence. But they said that, and they coerced a false confession out of that teenager. Thankfully, years later, the governor pardoned him, and he should have. I mean, that, I mean I'm all for law and order, but I'm not for lying. You know? So I, that, that, I did not know that. I did not know that. Hopefully, it never comes in handy yet for any of us. But they actually have the right to lie in, uh, in, interrogation, in interrogating a suspect, and that... I'm not going to lie. I don't want to hear a lie. And Jesus is the truth. He's not a lie. Another aspect of Jesus in verse 7, Jesus has the key of David. The key of David. If you have the key to something, what does that imply? Ownership. 
And if you have the key, that means you have the ability to open. You can unlock. If you have a key to your house, you have the authority to open the lock to your house. If you have a safe and the key to the safe. We obviously don't take this to be literal here, a literal key. Although there were literal keys in that day. He that has the key of David. Key here, a symbol of authority and power. Jesus said to Peter and the apostles, I will give you the keys to my car. What do you say? The kingdom. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. That meant apostles, I'm giving you the authority to open the doors to my kingdom. And they started doing that on what day? The Pentecost, right? Acts 2. When they preached the gospel, they were using the keys and opening the door for people to obey the gospel and come in the kingdom or the church. Kingdom and church being the same thing. So Jesus, of course, when we speak of David here, again, David is, of course, we're studying about him on Sunday mornings, but his kingdom, of course, was a type of the kingdom to come and the church of the Lord. And so this, again, is simply underscoring the authority of Jesus then to rule his kingdom as being the king. So it says, he opens and no man shuts and shuts and no man opens. That is, only Jesus has the power and authority to open the gates of heaven and to shut the gates of heaven to allow in the faithful and to keep out those who choose to be unfaithful. That lengthy introduction in verse 7, again, just grabbing the attention of the readers of the church at Philadelphia and reminding them of these wonderful attributes of Jesus. Listen up into the words. Verse 8, and we've heard this phrase before many times, have we not? I know thy works. And if it can be known, Jesus knows it. This is supernatural knowledge. Behold, I have set before you an open door. Sometimes in the Bible, the word door is used literally, but not here. Most of the times in the Bible, the word door is used, as we would say, metaphorically. Paul said that a door of faith had been opened to the Gentiles. A, a great and effectual door was opened at Ephesus the door for the gospel opened at Troas. Instead of the word door, you could use the word opportunity. An open door simply means you have an opportunity to do, to do something. And I have set before you an opportunity, an open door. And this could have been reference to uh, referring to evangelism. This could have been a reference to serving others, an open door to salvation. It could have been a combination of all of that. I'm giving you an opportunity is the idea. Who can shut it? If the Lord opens it, who can shut it? No man can shut it. The Lord opens the door. If the Lord opens the door, that door stays open. If the Lord shuts the door, when Noah and his family, those animals went in the ark, who shut the door? God shut the door and nobody opened that door until God said, you know, at, at the end of the rain, the flood, and so forth, uh, the door be open. So when God opens the door, it's open. When he shuts it, it shuts it. And so I'm giving you an opportunity. I'm giving you this opportunity. It's been said, you know, there's really only one opportunity. You may have a similar opportunity but once we let one opportunity go by, that opportunity, what? Is gone forever. I know we, we pointed this out before, but the Greeks had a, had a, a picturesque way, I guess you say, of picturing opportunity. They viewed opportunity as a beautiful girl who could run really fast. And she had her hair all slicked back into a ponytail. And if you wanted to catch her, you had how many chances? As she went by, one chance. You couldn't catch her by running after her. 
You had one chance to grab her if you wanted that girl. That's how they pictured opportunity. You better grab that opportunity while you have it because once that one's gone, you'll never get that opportunity back is the idea. All right, so you've got an opportunity here. Again, whether it's evangelism, serving, salvation, God has opened this for them. No man can shut it. Notice he says, thou hast a little strength. And I don't know that that's rebuking them. I don't know that that's a rebuke. Other, it, it may be simply they're a small body of believers. You're small. You have a little strength, but you have strength. Something small can have strength, correct? We would think for David to kill Goliath, why well, he would have needed a, a sword, a massive sword, right? Is that what he used? Just a sling and a stone. Something very small, but something very, very effective. I think about small, I think about Gideon's army. Gideon was to defeat the Midianites. He had an impressive army. And of all things, God told Gideon what? You have too many men. You're going to have to get rid of some men. And God pared that army down to only 300 against a massive Midianite army. Small, but Gideon won. I was working in the yard yesterday afternoon, and I noticed there was a mockingbird very upset. And there was a hawk in the yard, those red-tailed hawks. And I mean, that mockingbird was giving it to that hawk. That hawk would have outweighed that mockingbird five times. It had been five times as big as that mockingbird. It finally set up on one of the poles there by the house, and I took a video of it. I just couldn't believe it. And that mockingbird, you could tell that hawk was frustrated, frustrated and worn out from flying. I mean, he chased him all over the yard. And I think he messed with the mama. I don't know. I don't know what he messed with. I think so. But uh, he, the, the point is, there was something small, ferocious. And you probably know that mockingbirds aren't afraid of you either. <laughs> They will attack you if you get close to the nest. What is my point? Small things can have strength. Here's a small congregation, evidently small, but they do have strength. You have a little strength, and he commends them for that. You have kept my word. They had faced some trial. They, haven't, they had not given in. You've not denied my name. It would have been easy to have denied the name of Jesus to escape problems. You didn't do that. You weren't ashamed to own your Lord as we sing. You kept my word. You didn't deny my name. Jesus says in Luke chapter 9 that if we are ashamed of Jesus now, guess what? <coughs> He's going to be ashamed of us then. They were not ashamed of the Lord. They did not deny his name. You confess me now, I'll confess you later. Don't give in. That's the encouragement he's giving them. Now some of this, we just have to say we don't know exactly what's going on here, what he's talking about. We can sort of make a stab, you know, at, at a little bit of this. He says in verse 9, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, there was a synagogue of Satan at Sardis. There was a synagogue of Satan here in Philadelphia. Here about the school in Pennsylvania, the uh, board was faced with a decision. Do we allow this, what was it called? After school Satan club to start meeting. I think there are four of them in the country now. Elementary, we're talking elementary kids. One of the parents was pushing for an after-school Satan club, a club to meet after-school elementary kids to talk about the devil and not in a bad way. Synagogue of Satan. And thankfully, thankfully, the board said what? Not on your life we're going to allow that. Eight to one. I don't know how they got the one vote, but eight to one, you're not starting that stuff here. And kudos to them, right? Thankfully, they had enough courage to stand up for that. 
But I don't know that Satan's too worried about an after-school Satan club. He's got folks wrapped around his finger anyway. He's probably more happy with, with uh, folks uh, just drinking and partying and drugging and all that rather than having an after-school Satan club. But anyway, there was a synagogue of Satan. Now, they would not have called themselves that. These were those who thought they were faithful to God. They say they are Jews. They were fleshly Jews, but they weren't Jews where it counted. Who is spiritual Israel today? Christians in the church. We are Jews today, spiritually speaking. That's what the Lord is saying here. Here are folks claiming they're faithful to God. They're not. They lie. Back in verse 7, I've got, a, I've got the word true underlined in verse 7. I've got the word lie underlined in verse 9. And an arrow drawn from verse 7 to 9. Jesus is true. These are those who do lie. They do lie. He says, I'm going to make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. And here's where we just have to sort of, your opinion's as good as mine on what this means, worship before thy feet. We do know what it does not mean. We do know that men are not to be what? Worshipped. It's not that he would make them worship them but he would make them worship in their presence, not that they would worship. One school of thought is these lying Jews would be converted to the truth. And if that's the meaning, then they would gather in the assembly and they would worship with these faithful Christians. And you would hope that that would be the meaning. You know, you'll one day worship together because these folks are going to be converted. And maybe that's the door open to convert these lying Jews. Another school of thought is that these enemies would come to see that God's people really were the real thing, but they would still refuse to hear and heed the faith that is in Christ. Either way, don't worry about these. They're not a threat to you. I will deal with these lying Jews. You maintain the faith. In verse 10, because you've kept the word of my patience, I will keep you. You kept me. You didn't give up on me. It was tempting to perhaps. You kept the word of my patience. I'm going to keep you from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. And again, this could very well be a time of persecution that was coming from the Roman Empire. It is said, and this is just food for thought, it is said that the Roman Emperor Trajan was deathly afraid of earthquakes. He didn't like earthquakes. And he would not go near a city like Philadelphia that was earthquake prone, nor would he send his soldiers to earthquake prone areas. That may explain what the Lord is saying here. I will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the earth to try, try, to try them that dwell on the earth. They're going to be spared this massive invasion from Rome because simply that uh, they lived in an earthquake prone area. Well, maybe so, maybe not. But in any event, Jesus says, I'm going, you, you kept me, I'm going to keep you. you. You just hang in there and I'm going to be there with you and, and for you. Did Jesus care about these people? Does Jesus care about his people today? Absolutely. In fact, the Bible says, Paul says uh, that uh, there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted above that which you're able to bear, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape. You might tie that, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, with this Revelation 3, verse 10, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation. I'll provide you a way of escape. Yes, sir. 
on that path, on that verse that you just read in verse 10, you know, when you're talking about what that could possibly mean, you have to be careful with footnotes in your Bible. My footnote says that is a promise that God will rapture the, the faithful before the tribulation starts. Right. So I don't think that's true. <laughs> And that Neil makes a, a, a valid, good point. Those footnotes were not put there by God. Those footnotes are put there by men. Sometimes they're helpful, but in that case, <laughs> very, very harmful, right? Very, very, very harmful. Uh, that's putting into the text something that is not there. The rapture's not there, tribulation's not there. None of that's there. But uh, again, you have to be, be careful and cautious of some of those. Good, good point to bring out. And if you'll wrap, wrap us up, verses 11 through 13, read those, and we'll be through with Philadelphia tonight. Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. All right, back to verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. That may refer to the manner in which he comes instead of the time of his coming. Jesus promised he would return. That is his second coming. It's been 2,000 years, so in that sense it hasn't been quick. But when Jesus does come, it's going to be what? Same. Quick. It's going to be quick when he does come. He's not saying I'm going to, it's going to be quick when I come, but when I come, it will be quick. It'll be a quick coming. There's a difference between the two. I don't know here, though, that he's talking about the second coming of Jesus when he says, I, I come quickly, because that really would not phase them if that's what he's talking about. I think this ties into verse 10. Whatever his keeping them from the hour of temptation, whatever that involved, he would come quickly to deal with that situation. When he came, he would come quickly to deal with that situation. Your job in the meantime is to what? Hold fast. Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. What they had was faith. What they had was strength. It might've been a little strength, but they had strength. So hold on to that little strength. Hold on to your faith. Hold on to your crown. What's he mean when he says, no man take your crown? An eternal life. Eternal life, a crown of life, right? And so that tells us it is possible for a person to lose his crown, correct? Correct. Why the warning? If you cannot lose your salvation or your crown of life, why the warning here? If once saved, always saved is true, then you've got a massive problem with Revelation 3, verse 11. Why well, worry about holding fast? Why well, worry about Jesus coming quickly? Why well, worry about somebody taking my crown because nobody can take my crown? Well, Jesus says somebody can if you don't hold fast. Verse 12 says, overcome. Him that overcometh, he who overcomes, Will I make a pillar in the temple of my God? Well, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like much of a blessing. I'm going to make you a fence post. I'm going to make you a, a support beam. Well, not literally, obviously, right? Not literally. You think of a pillar, a massive pillar in a huge building. That pillar is practically permanent. In other words, it's solid, it's stable, it is, it is steadfast. I think that's the meaning he's driving at here. The idea, people living in an earthquake prone area, a little bit nervous every time, you know, it rumbles or whatever. Well, in heaven, you're not gonna have to worry about that. In heaven, you're not gonna run out of the city. You're not going to flee the city. I'm gonna set you firm in my temple of my God. And you won't have to worry about going out. If you overcome, uh, this is the key, if you overcome. 
I will write upon him the name of my God. The name of my God. Well, if you write your name on something, that implies that you... A lot of mechanics will take their tools and they'll take a pen and they'll inscribe their name on their wrenches. Why? You bought any wrenches lately? <laughs> They're very expensive. So you write your name on there, hopefully nobody will, uh, will you know, erase that or, or mark it out. Whenever I buy a book, and I don't buy many books anymore, I'm trying to call mine out. But whenever I buy a book, I do not write my name on the dust jacket. Why not? Well, somebody who wants my book, you just throw the dust, dust jacket away. I do not write my name on this part of the book. I write my name on the binding part of the book. Why? It's more, it's more permanent. I can somebody rip this page out, but getting rid of the name on the on the binding itself. You're probably laughing at this, but if you bought books lately, you know what I mean. Books are expensive, about as expensive as tools. You write your name on something to show ownership. God, uh, Jesus says, if you overcome, I'm going to write God's name on you, indicating God what? Owns you. That's wonderful. That is, that is wonderful. Back then, if, if you were a great patron of a city and you did something special for the city, they would take that person's name and inscribe it in a prominent place so that when people came in that building, they'd see that person's name inscribed in stone. We do that today, don't we? If you donate enough money to a college, well, they might even name a building after you. Tanya's about to retire from ICC after 35, six years. We're ready to see her name go up somewhere. <laughs> well, she hasn't chucked $10 million in, so I don't know that she'll get her name on a building. But anyway, that's what we do. I'm going to write God's name on you. Ownership. I'm going to write the name of the city of my God. I'm going to write where you live. And the city's name is what? New Jerusalem. What had happened to old Jerusalem? Destroyed. 20 years before this, it was destroyed. Now there's a Jerusalem today, and there was then, but for the most part, it was destroyed. This is New Jerusalem, a reference to heaven. No doubt a reference to heaven, the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Okay? And the name of Christ, the name of God, the name of where you live. And nobody is going to object to any of that. But that, again, that's all based on what? Overcoming. Overcoming. Being faithful. Not caving in, not giving in, not becoming lukewarm, not caring anymore, but being fervent for the Lord, just as fervent now as the day of your conversion. And then verse 13, as is said in every letter, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Your thoughts as we're out of time this evening. And we're out of battery. <laughs> so we'll drive a peg there. We've got one more letter. What letter is that? Laodicea. Laodicea. That's next Wednesday, verses 14 through 22, Revelation 3. So we'll look at that then.